Hi, everybody. I'm Dixon. And I'm Jose. And welcome to episode 10 of Southwest Side Stories. We've got a really good episode today. We're talking to Alejandra, who is a parent and former teacher at Eberhardt Elementary. And if you're familiar with Eberhardt Elementary, um, but you're not from the area, the school is in Chicago Lawn, um, you may have heard this story that you know was big in the local media uh, about a month ago, that there was a cleaning scandal where CPS basically you know, had outsourced the management of um, cleaning services to a third party and they weren't holding up their end of the bargain. So the school was basically going unclean for a long period of time. Um, and parents and teachers and administrators had to go in one weekend and, and basically clean the school themselves. Uh, so that was embarrassing for um, CPS. There have been some repercussions uh, after that story came out and rightfully so. Um, but we want to talk about that and also more about the Everhart community itself. Um, for people who maybe only have heard of the school from this story, what should they know about Everhart? Um, Jose, what are you interested in hearing about um, from Alejandra? You know, just uh, it's, you know, this new story uh, is interesting. It kind of highlights what's going on at this moment, you know, um, in our city, in our part of the city. But um, also like the Southwest side, you know, it's kind of built up for our uh, public parks or public spaces to be better utilized. And uh, so we feel that neglect a lot more when um, those spaces are underfunded. Um, you know, it's part of the reason why I support community engagement. So I'm just learning, I'm hoping to learn more, um, you know, about her experience in the community, local history, and, uh, you know, what got us to this moment. I am uh, here with uh, Alejandra to talk about the uh, community around Eberhardt Elementary School. Excited to hear more about the, um, uh, the community at the school, which is just north of Marquette Park in Chicago Lawn. Um, Alejandra, can you start by telling us a little bit about your experience with the school and the community? Sure. So my name is Alejandra Frosta Seves. Um, I'm a resident of West Lawn. I live about two blocks away from the school, and I have two children that currently are at Eberhardt. My daughter, Sochi, who is in third grade, and my son, Joaquin, who's a fifth grader at the school. And um, I would say since the moment that we moved to the community in 2013, um, we, my, my husband and I, who we're both educators, we both kind of knew we're going to be sending our children to the neighborhood school, so what can we do to support our neighborhood school, right? And so very early on when we moved into the community, my husband actually um, became a member of the LST for Eberhardt. And so, um, and that's something that he currently still does. Um, at some point um, when I was, I was a teacher and I was an educator, I decided to teach at Eberhardt. And so I became a sixth grade science teacher there for two years from 2017 to 2019. Um, and so I've got into kind of deal with Everhart, like, you know, really engage with Everhart, not just as a parent before even having children, because, we, you know, before our children went to Everhart, my husband was on the local school council as a community member. And then when our, our children actually started going to the school, he was a parent. And so now as a parent, you know, as community members, as a teacher, and as parents of kids, right, we've engaged with Everhart in a lot of different ways. And I think um, one of the things that really struck me when I first got to really be in the school as a teacher was um, that actually there was a, a few other colleagues in the building whose children also went to Eberhardt. Um, and for me, that's very telling, right? Because when you have educators who are willing to have their own children be educated in that space, that, that means something about that space, right? Um, a lot of times we see teachers at a school who say, I would never send my kid here, right? So what does it mean when educators would and do send their children there? You know, I think that that um, that says something about I think what's happening and what we're trying to build. And it seems like there's a very involved uh, parent community at Everhart as well. You mentioned you know 1,200 students, and I know that schools across the Southwest Side have 
you know, really particularly high enrollment. When you look at CPS as a whole, like a lot of the highest enrollment schools are are on the mm -hmm. Southwest mm -hmm. side. Um, mm -hmm. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how, you know, parents are involved in Everhart sort of at the community level, because it seems like there's a strong connection between the school and the community. Yeah, I mean, so um, one of the organizations that I know has supported that sort of trajectory and that growth has been SWAP. Um, they have a partnership with the school. And so they're able to actually bring in funds so that their parents are there, not just voluntarily, but, you know, actually also getting a small stipend. I say small because, you know, it's not like they're, you know, it's a full-time job necessarily, right? But but they're able to create opportunities for parents to come in and be additional teacher's assistants, right? So when I was um, teaching there with my sixth grade class, um, both years, but really the second year that I was there, I built a stronger relationship with the parent mentor that would come in. And, you know, she was coming in even beyond what she was required to because she was just really engaged in what we were learning and building relationships with students. and that opportunity was really great for me because, you know, I think it's really important for students to see that people care about what they're learning and what they're doing in the classroom and being able to have parents there that can also affirm and support them in their learning was, was really, um, really important, you know? And so you have parent mentors inside classrooms, um, volunteering and coming in like twice a week, but sometimes more to support teachers. Um, you also see parents coming in and running like special events for students, right? I mean, in all this, you know, I guess I, I'll say it, put an asterisk to all of this that COVID, right, has made some modifications to some of these things. Um, but there still are parent mentors coming in. But, uh, you know, prior to, to the pandemic, um, there was other events, right, that, that were happening. There was like mass nights and things like that where parent support was, was really helpful. Um, but like I mentioned before, right, staff members are also parents, and that's not, that's something that's visible, so that I think that also creates, continues to support and creating, creating a space where it really feels like family is welcomed. Um, and I think anytime you have a community school that is really grounded in the community, you see families there, right? You, it's not just one family, but then their cousins, and then, you know what I mean? And then second generations, like, there's multiple families that I've spoken to, um, you know, whose children are friends with my son, for instance, where their moms were students at Eberhardt and where the principal was their teacher, right? And so it's crazy to sort of even sort of see those generations still in the neighborhood and talking about the teachers that they had and the things that they learned and their experiences in the building and now hearing their children talking about those experiences. So I think like those are all dynamics that support the community-based um, approach that the school has. And I guess one last thing I'll mention that is another example for me is even looking at somebody like the assistant principal, Adam Ramirez, who um, at, originally was a math teacher in the community and continued to stay on, but he's also a community member. And so he'll talk about his experiences as a young person in the community and now as an educational leader. And, and it's not all like sunny and perfect, right? When we think about this neighborhood and we think about Marquette Park and things that happen there, right? Um, there's also these dynamics that we can learn from historically in the, in the community. Like I, I'll give you a very quick example. When I was teaching sixth grade there um, and it was like Black History Month, we were, students wanted to learn, um, you know, or, or I was really um, asked to do something with students, right? And so one of the things that I found really interesting was that students had no idea about what was what had happened in Marquette Park with Martin Luther King, right? And you know, I know Iman has done a lot of work in the community to really elevate um, th those like historical moments, right? And they have that monument that was put there. And so, you know, I, I asked my students, you know, what what is that monument for, right? And almost all of them had no idea. Like they'd seen it, but they weren't really sure what it was about or why it was there. Um, and so we engaged in, in uncovering some of that history together, right, of like why, 
why were Martin Luther King come to Chicago? Why would he come to Market Park, right? And, and started looking at some of those images. And we ultimately ended up writing a play together. So, you know, with the six, myself with the sixth graders on it, and we performed it. Well, I say we, but because I feel like a part of it, but they really, right? And they performed it for the school. But what was really interesting is when we were practicing and coming into the auditorium in preparation for the performance, um, we had various staff members, teachers, even the principal. So a lot of staff members who were Black, Black teachers and principals coming in and um, adding their layer of history with the community, right? So the principal came in when we were practicing and talked about how when she first started working at Eberhardt, um, this is Nikita Gunn, before she started working at Eberhardt, the way she took the job, her family members were actually really concerned, right? And they were really worried, like, you're going to go work in that community, right? Because this area, in some ways, had been like a KKK stronghold, right? And Martin Luther King and certain people were not welcomed at that time, right? And so um, so she talked to my students a little bit about what that was like for her, right? And we had another um, Black teacher come in and tell the students about how, you know, she remembered being told she shouldn't even look out the window if they were driving down 63rd Street because, like, they, they may get attacked, right? And so... Um, so I, get, I bring that story up because I feel like we are a community that is still becoming, that is still transforming, right? That has these historical legacies that now is becoming like this Latinx community in some ways, right? It's transforming, but we have um, a Black community just to the east of us that is also a part of Chicago Lawn, right? And so um, our Eberhardt is largely Latino. I mean, I would say it's over 90% Latino, right? Um, but 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 we still do have Black students and we do have, um, you know, and, and but, but either, even if we didn't, right, it's important for our community to understand what has happened around there. And, and I think the fact that we care about those things and are continuing to try to understand who we are in relation to the things around us um, is another layer that makes, um, the community within a heart stronger. So it sounds like, you know, there's there's a really tight-knit community at Everhart. There's a multiracial community at Everhart that, you know, is really coming together and doing valuable things within the school community. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit, because you mentioned COVID, and obviously mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. has interrupted uh, all facets of our lives, yeah. but you yeah. know, maybe nowhere as much as, as in education. So, you know, we transition to, um, you know, to remote learning in, uh, in the spring of 2020. Mm -hmm. um, and CPS just came back to in-person learning this fall full time. Um, so I wonder if you could talk a little bit about, you know, as, as a parent and as educators, you know, how how was that adjustment and, uh, you know, how, how are things going this year? I mean, that was a rough adjustment, you know, like I will just to add another like complexity into it. Um, those two years. So, you know, I told you I was an educator in Eberhardt from 2017 to 2019. When I left in 2019, it was actually to take a position in the district for CPS. And so I was leading the work for service learning across the whole district. Um, and so, you know, there's, I guess there's this like this added layer too of like, you know, like there's, there's this chaos happening and it's actually happening across the whole city, right? It's not even, and so myself as a parent, I had the dynamic of thinking about, well, what's happening with my own children here at Eberhardt, but then there's also a dynamic of like, well, across the city, what are we seeing and what are the needs, right? And do some communities need more support than other communities, right? Um, but, you know, I, I, all I can really say from the rollout um, from Eberhardt is I think it was pretty similar to how it was across the whole district, right? First, it was, you know, if we're going to be learning remotely with, with computers, how do we make sure everybody has one, right? Um, on my end, at working for the district, part of what I was asked to do was actually make phone calls. And so I had a list of like 300 kindergarten families that I was responsible for calling um to see whether what they needed right because at that point it was scrambling like do you need access to food right do you need access to internet do you need access to a device like there was just so many um 
different needs that that everybody was trying to do and people were trying to do it at the district level it was happening in areas it was happening within schools and you know and I, I think of as a parent I was lucky in that both of my children went to one school and so I only had to deal with the dynamics of, of one school of Eberhardt but there were parents across the city that had one child at this place and another child here and another child over here where you know, I can only imagine the complexity of that because, you know, people roll things out slightly differently. Um, um, so I, I feel like I remember it's it's so vague because, you know, sometimes when things are tough, we don't always remember all the new all those nuances. We kind of um, block some of them and just kind of keep going. So it's hard for me to recall um, everything other than to kind of feel like as a parent, there is this balance of the anxiety and the fear from the unknown of you know we're at a point now where we're we're told like it's not even safe to go out like what does that mean I've never experienced something like that in my life you know um and having young children at the time of the pandemic I had just had my third child my daughter Ketsali and so she was about a month old a month and a half old when everything shut down right which per personally created this whole other layer of oh my god I have a small child and there's this um you know pandemic going on right can't go anywhere you know yeah. um but i i think you know we we tried our best the local school council the school kept trying to meet um i think teachers tried their best in making sure parents had what they needed or differentiating or or shifting right what instruction looked like like i know for my children when we first started um we were kind of under this assumption that the everybody's going to be on computers the whole time from 8 30 to 3 30 which felt really difficult in it and it was right and it shifted to you know we're going to have synchronous asynchronous time right we'll do an instruction for this time then you go on your own and you practice it and then you come back um you know I, so i but it's difficult to talk about like generalities that way because i think when it comes to instruction remotely there's this layer of individual classroom norms that also plays a role right um teachers have, have been used to doing things a certain amount are, are used to doing things a certain way for a certain amount of time right and so all of a sudden they're they're moved into this remote remote way of teaching and they had to automatically adjust and so you know a teacher who like to see students sit a certain way with a certain amount of eye contact because that's how they knew, right, that they were engaged or they were following along, all of a sudden didn't have that view in a remote way, right? And so that kind of, I can only imagine, created a lot of dissonance into, well, what's really happening? Are students really learning? Or are they there, right? And so, um, and it put a lot of pressure on us as parents, right, to be like, wait, are you listening? You know, did you do that? You know. Is, are you done? Is that it? That's all the work you had to do. And so, it's, you know, I, it, it's difficult, right? Like, I, so I, I, I like to think we all did the best that we could. Um, you know, I don't, I wasn't personally very concerned with any type of like learning loss. You know, I saw a lot of opportunities to shift the conversations and what they were learning into the, into the, you know, our kitchen table or into the dining room table while we were eating dinner, right? Um, I know in my own work, in service learning for the district, that was definitely how I was trying to engage teachers as well, right? How can these inquiries and things that students are learning about be something that they learn with their parents and learn with community members or family members? Because that's who they're with. This fall, CPS returned to full-time uh, in-person learning um, with, you know, obvious adjustments and modifications and all that. Um, so, you know, one thing that, that came up in recent weeks, there was a big news story about Everhart. So if people are familiar, if the name sounds familiar, it might be because, you know, they heard this story about CPS really sort of falling down on the job in terms of, uh, of, of cleaning. You know, they were allowing, um, you know, Everhart to go uncleaned for a long period of time. Um, can you talk a little bit about that, about you know, how parents and the school community reacted to this and, uh, you know, 
and and what you all did to try to rectify the situation? Yeah. Um, so I, I think it's important to note that um, the I, I know that the pictures and the story right showed the school as unclean and there and it definitely was because we weren't we didn't have the custodians that we needed but i think that the, the flip side and, and i want to say this because of things i saw on social media like is that they didn't stay that way right the whole point of taking those pictures was to like prove a point to say look at how this is but then somebody actually did clean it right like the principal the assistant principal was in there in the boys bathroom you know the um the other assistant principal was out there, you know, uh, moving trash. So was the principal. So were the teachers, right? Which were the pictures that you saw. Um, but to, to just kind of like walk it back a little bit, right? Um, we know that CPS is going to say we weren't going to use Airmark or any of those people. We're just going to deal with our own cleaning situations. Um, decided to give this contract to Airmark. And so um, one thing that I think a lot of people don't, understand that I think is an important clarification to the issue is that these custodians the custodian salaries are still being paid by CPS, right? The $369 million that Aramark gets is for managerial, is like for the management of that and for, I think, um, like materials possibly, right? So um, I, that's important to note because the issue that that Everhart had was one about the man was on the managerial side, right? So we had it's a large school, and so I think we are supposed to get something like six six custodians. Um, and from the very beginning of the year, it was very clear that we were only going to get about one or one or two if we were lucky, right? And now some of that was was planned. And what I mean by that is there was at least two custodians from from what I, I'm aware of that were actually on some type of like medical leave that was that had a, was already a part of that process, right? So that means that like when you think about it, like if there's in a classroom, right, this would be like two teachers who you know are going to be out. And so it's the school's responsibility to get substitutes or get some sort of like temporary replacement for them. So that's what Aramark should have done, right? Um, because Aramark knew, and, and that's literally what they're getting money for. Like, they should have, at that point, said, well, we need to get these two other people in here to replace these two people that are going to be gone, right? Um, but they didn't do that. And so um, we were already going to be out. And so that's why it got so bad. That's why it got from, like, the six to the one to the two, right? Um, and there's really nothing that the school can do because the school is not responsible for the hiring of these people, right? Um, and so the my, my understanding in all of this, right, is that the principal was telling Aramark, hey, we know these people are out, like, where are our replacements, right? Like, hey, like, we're supposed to be cleaning this way, right? And, and so certain things happened, like, you know, I know CPS said that every school was going to have deep cleaning happening a certain amount of time. So all of a sudden that deep cleaning weekend came, and there was still just one custodian. Well, that one custodian is not even able to clean the whole school, let alone do any sort of deep cleaning, right? And so it just kind of like continued and continued and it just kept like compounding and compounding. Um, and so at some point, right, they, there was an emer so there was an emergency LSD meeting because at this point, you know, it's like, what can we do? Like, we don't know what to do. We've asked every single person we could ask down the chains of command. Um, we have sent emails, we have sent pictures, we're documenting all of this, and it just doesn't seem to bring urgency to anybody, right? Um, and so this was brought up to community members and parents in this emergency meeting, and there were staff members there, right, sort of giving their um, comments on what the things that they had been doing, the things that they had been noticing, right? And And I think for a lot of staff members, it was really painful, because again, a lot of these staff members send their own children there. And so they're seeing these unjust conditions and it's not other people's children, right? It's their own children too. And it's just like, this isn't right. And at the same time, we have, we have staff members who have friends and families in other schools and other schools are being cleaned and they're much smaller. 
and and they have more custodians. And so then we're asking this question of, but wait, like, okay, yes, there's a pandemic. It's it's difficult to hire people, right? Though, you know, sidebar, it is difficult to hire people if you're not giving them just wages and you're not giving them the benefits that they deserve, right? But but that on the side, right? Yes, it's difficult to hire people. But then, but if you're managing custodians across the city, what is up with your management that you are not seeing that a space that houses 1,200 students, like it's just not going to work for them to have one, and these other spaces that maybe only have three, 400 students have two or three. You know, you tell parents and they're ready to mobilize, right? So like the very first thing, and like we had to push back on this because the very first thing that some parents wanted to do were like, all right, pues, I'll show up. Yo me voy con mi escoba, right? Like I'll go right. and I'll clean then. I'll, I'll do it. Come on, when are we going, right? And I even had parents, like my neighbor across the street and I was picking up like, so when are we going to go in and clean, right? And I'm just like, look, like I'm not opposed to that, right? Like, I, but, but still like, we should still be asking like the people who are getting paid for this to yeah. either to do something about it too. Like we can't, for me, it's like, if we're going to do that, then are they going to give us that money? <laughs> right. Mm-hmm. Which is what, what my daughter was was said when they, when they were interviewing her for that piece. Right. Because she was asking me that at the dining room table, but wait, like if they're getting money for this management and it's the principal and assistant principal and the teachers managing then like, are they going to get that money? And it's like, I don't think that's how it works. So she, oh, well, it doesn't seem right. Like, you're right, it doesn't, you know? Um, yeah. So I, 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 you know, maybe I give you a long winded answer here, but I think, you know, I, I am very proud of how the parents, and I will say especially the mothers, right? Because um, in terms of who the parents were that really stepped up, it was predominantly women, Um you know, I'm, I'm really proud of how the mother stepped up and said, like, you know, anything for my child, right? Like, if I need to come in. And I know that that's not unique to just our community. I, I know that that happens in a, in a lot of other communities as well, right? Um, women tend to take on a certain amount of, of la- extra labor that we don't always get credit for. Um, but I think the point, the larger point for me in the struggle is around you know what what is happening with with this management like if we is this are we going to leave this contract or are we not going to leave this contract I, I i don't really know but i i know that our children deserve a lot more um and I, I would love to see those funds actually going to the people that are actually doing the work that those funds are supposed to go towards you know yeah yeah I, that sounds like a good a good idea to me. The the funds are <laughs> dedicated for a job and whoever's doing the job should be the people getting paid. But um yeah, I think it, it's interesting because the way that the stories um you know were sort of presented, uh I think a lot of people's takeaways were, you know, oh look, this is a very um you know, involved parent community that's coming together and going above and beyond and, you know, cleaning their children's school. Um, but also like, wow, that's not their job and they shouldn't have to do that. So it's embarrassing for CPS and they need to fix the situation. So, you know, like both of those things can be true. Like we can applaud, you know, the school Mm -hmm. community Mm -hmm. coming together and doing something that was really overdue and necessary and also say, to CPS and to people in charge, like you, you need to, you know, you need to get your act together. Yeah. I mean, I think that communities are, are going to get together and do what they got to do. Right. But it doesn't make it right. Right. Which is like the, the big piece that we were trying to um, also like engage parents in. Right. Because I think like, and, and I see it too, on the one hand, you just want to just get it done. Right. Like you, you see this problem and you, you you start learning about the politics behind it and policies that kind of like limit. And sometimes you just kind of like, you know what, that's all talk. Let's put that to the side. Like, let's just do it. Right. Our, our young people deserve a clean school. The staff deserve a clean school. Right. Um, but that's, that's short sighted in the, the sense that like, it's not sustainable. Right? right. We can't, we can't keep just going in 
and doing these things or you know we need the 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 structures to work and if they don't work then they need to change right like I don't know if this is pointing at well maybe managerial cleaning decisions shouldn't be made at a district level maybe they do belong as grassroots school level decisions like they used to be before it, you know they were privatized You should know that I'm a type of teacher that believes like learning that happens in the classroom shouldn't just stay in the classroom. It should go into the community. And so a lot of the work that I did with my students gravitated in that way. And so one of the things that we were learning um, in my sixth grade science class was about like microorganisms and how they're like all around us. Right. And so my students wanted to do a study of the school and how clean it was. And so we actually swabbed different places that they were really curious about. And we grew the bacteria and Petri dishes to, to try to get an like a understanding through data of what is actually happening around our school. Now this was pre-COVID, right? Yeah. And so even pre-COVID, when my students shared some of their findings with the principal, the very first thing the principal wanted to do was have my students present it to custodians and to people at Airmark because she had been trying to communicate to them that things were not being cleaned to, a, to an extent that she wanted, right? And she believed that the students and the staff deserved. And here, like my students, like Creed had evidence, right? Um, but, so, but so even back then, you know, and she came and had a conversation with my students about how um, custodians work and who hires them and all that stuff, right? And because young people don't know that either. And so when, when you don't understand structurally what's happening, you make assumptions about people instead of seeing like the systemic shortfalls, right? And so the very first thing that when we started our study, uh, my sixth graders first were sort of saying things like, well, it's because the custodians don't care. They don't do a good job. They don't write like it's all this individual blaming. Um, yeah. But then when they actually started analyzing the problem more systemically, started like talking to the principal about what the issues were, then all of a sudden they saw it as like, oh, okay, this is kind of larger than individual decisions, right? And so I wanted to bring that up because I mean, now we're like in this post-COVID moment where we're also really clear, care about sanitation and cleaning and disinfecting for other reasons, right? Beyond just kind of what, what we normally cared about before. But it's very easy sometimes to go with the immediate story, which is to kind of give blame to individuals, right? Well, these custodians don't do a good job. Well, you know, the the principal doesn't care. Oh, this teacher doesn't care. And then the one that was most prominent on social media is these these young people don't care, right? Look at how these young people are trashing this, right? Look at how they're doing this. Their parents didn't teach them any manners. Their parents did this, right? But I refuse that narrative because those pictures, again, are, pic are, are things that happen across the whole city. But we don't say those things about other communities. We don't say that they don't have a right to have somebody clean their building, right? And no other like communities or schools do we say, well, you know, really, if, if that kid hadn't used the bathroom, then maybe it wouldn't be dirty, right? Like it's like, right. no, like we're here and be like, these are young children, they are still learning. Like there's just so many layers beyond why, why that's wrong. I'm too many layers about why that's wrong. But when we, when we push to kind of blame in, at the individual level, we lose, the, the systemic critique and, and really the, the structural things that perpetuate those cycles, right? And so um, I really hope that the, that the news story does something for sort of mobilizing um, parents and community members to kind of look beyond even the media to, to the larger issues that are happening, you know, in, in terms to like the types of contracts that happen, right, that, that these different agencies get within our schools. Yeah, that's that's a really good point about, you know, like um, how uh, a lot of people might be tempted to blame, you know, uh, a child for making a mess or, you know, because uh, individual custodian for not cleaning it up or, uh, you know, and, and pin it at the individual level. But if you have a school of 1200 students and one custodian, like these could be the neatest students in the city. <laughs> It wouldn't matter. And the hardest working custodian in the city, and it wouldn't matter, yeah. Um, it wouldn't matter.
you mentioned that, you know, your, your daughter was impacted. I mean, she goes to the school and mm -hmm. she also spoke with the media about, you know, the situation at Everhart. So I wonder what her impressions of all of this are, you know, talking to the media and also, you know, just, uh, you know, the whole situation. Yeah, so, um, you know, my daughter Sochil is, I feel like, one of those people we're, we're going to look out for <laughs> because she um, she has a few different campaigns and things that she's been focused on. Um, and so, you know, she she came home once and started talking about that story around the, the roach in the bathroom, right? Because at that point, she was the line leader. And so when you're the line leader, you're you're in the bathroom. Um, making sure that if people come in and out, come in and out, right? And and so there was a, a student who was and ah I yelled, right? Because and so she went to to see what's going on. Why why is it just you know? Um, and so when she came home and talked about it, was right around the time when we started hearing there's going to be this emergency LSC meeting because there's this issue happening, right? Um, and it's and so just to counter that slightly, right? I have my son is also an Eberhard and he's a fifth grader. And and I when I attended the emergency LSC meeting and I spoke, I said, you know, I think my son hasn't brought up these issues because for him, he's just so happy to be in school, right? He's so happy that, like, he's not doing e-learning, that he's there, that, like, he's got these, like, blinders on and it's just, it's like, our interactions, that's what matters. But my daughter has always been a lot more critical of things around her, right? And so she, um, even though I was really happy to be in school, um, was sort of noticing these things, right? And so when the emergency LSC meeting happened, um, I was actually, um, I attended it from, from my house, from right here. And I mentioned to her, hey, there's going to be this LSC meeting right now on it. Um, do you want to tell them what you told me about what you saw, right? And for me, it was kind of like, well, do you want to speak? I've never heard that LSC meetings can't have children, right? Or that children can't be participants. So I just thought it was a good opportunity for her to, um, to give her voice, to lend her voice to, right? And so um, parents started talking and some parents by like, paraphrasing what their children had told them. And so then um, my my daughter um, spoke at the LSC meeting and, you know, and she, she, she was super nervous, right? Really cute. So she was writing down what she wanted to say so that she wouldn't forget. <laughs> and, um, and, and, you know, she, she said her piece and I guess at the, there was a um, journalist at the LSC at the emergency LSC meeting, and so when they um, were talking to people about the story, right, and what was happening, um, they contacted us and, and asked if if we'd be willing to allow my my daughter to to say something. And so you know she was really excited about it. Um, I think you know I think she's excited on it from the point of view of wanting to create change, right, and if we say these things and we call it out, we can um, gain momentum, right? And we and we can fix these things in our school. So um, when when the story came out, right, we showed it to her, and you know she she had mixed feelings in the sense that she's like, oh, that's cool, but then kind of got over it. Right? So she's like, you know, because I think for her it was kind of like, well, so are, is the is it going to be clean, right? Like, are we? And now, right, the question that I ask her periodically is like, what does it look like, right? Because again, I'm hoping that there's a, a larger like systemic change, not just like this one-time deal. Eberhardt is a community school, right? Um, the children that go there the and their families, like we all live in the community. And so we care not just about the school itself and our children in there, but I, but I think our the West Lawn and Chicago Lawn communities as well, right? And so um, the the beautiful thing about community schools is that they create these spaces for us to build community, literally, right? And um, and and I and I'd like to think that this is an example of how we can do that, and how we can do that and unify to create change where we see inequities or where we see, um, you know, just things not being done the right way, you know, for, for our young people and for our staff. And so I think um, that would be one big takeaway. I know like in the, in the heated debate in Chicago of school choice, 
and whether we should be sending our children to selective enrollment schools, to option schools, to community schools. Um, I don't want this story to be something in people's minds for this is why I don't send my kid to a community school, right? Because the, the spaces that get these types of harms are community schools, right? You know, we wouldn't see this happening in the selective enrollment school, right? But, but that aside, that's not what I, I hope people take from the story. I actually hope that they can take the opposite, that because it's a community school, we have the possibilities to actually really build community. And, and that is one of the beautiful things about community schools. And actually, the more that we send our schools and support the commu those community schools, the stronger they will become and the more they support our communities as a whole, right? And so I, I hope actually that that story and that ability to kind of change and, and to bring in parents will show other people why these spaces really matter. All right. I thought that was a really good interview with Alejandra. Uh, learned a lot about what's going on at Everhart, um, you know, how they responded to the cleaning scandal that was going on at the school, and also a lot of other really wonderful things that are going on in the community and at Everhart. Um, it was great to hear how many teachers at Everhart also have um, their children attending the school. Um, it was great to hear about how they put together the play. Um, to educate students about the history of Dr. King and Marquette Park and all sorts of other things. Um, what were some highlights for you? I mean, uh, Alejandro shared so much um, of the community history and kind of its uh, kind of dynamics. Um, and uh, it's, it's great that, you know, there's still this kind of level of engagement with that history of uh, the impact that Marquette Park's, uh, you know, uh, coincided with Martin Luther King's uh, movement had, you know, here in our community. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it's, it's interesting because I'm not sure, you know, how aware people are of, uh, of the history, but I just wanted to read this quote um, that people may have heard or, or may not have heard. But when Dr. King came to Chicago in the late 60s, um, you know, he encountered a lot of violent resistance in Marquette Park and in Cicero as well. Um, and he told reporters, quote, I have never seen, even in Mississippi and Alabama, mobs as hateful as I've seen here in Chicago. So that was the response, um, you know, that, uh, that Dr. King got when he came to Chicago to talk about, um, to talk about housing um, and segregation, you know, was and is a problem in Chicago. So um, it's yeah. it's interesting to bring that history forward. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I thought that the school was doing a great job of bringing that history forward. And it sounds like the students and the families were really engaged with it as well. So yeah, you know, I think that uh, Martin Luther King's history is one that um, we should be more appreciative of, you know, at, at this moment, um, you know, that the country keeps kind of going, fluctuate into how it wants to look at itself and respond moving forward. Um, and I think that people that really yearn for a, uh, you know, uh, class or identity, is it either or, have to look at his history here in Chicago specifically, is when there was a hard pivot to let's organize sanitation workers, you know, let's start building bridges across with, uh, with labor. And a lot of it had to do with what he saw was the dynamics here in Chicago. Uh, um, you know, I'm, we hope that this kind of level of community engagement uh, educates people on. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, those dynamics still exist. And so we've got to, you know, continue to keep pushing forward in terms of, you know, making sure that people have the ability to, you know, rent and or own where they like and make sure that housing is affordable and, and all of that. Um, so yeah, I thought it was a really great episode. Um, one other quick thing I wanted to highlight before we, uh, break for the year is, um, that we are going to be going to, um, a monthly podcast in 2022. So this will be the last episode of 2021. Um, we've been doing every two weeks up until now, but, you know, going into the, 
into the next year, we're going to be doing monthly on the first Monday of every month. So first Monday of January, we'll have a new episode and then the first Monday of every month uh, after that. So that's a schedule that's going to work a little bit, a little bit better for us. Um, and hopefully people continue to, uh, to tune in. I think we're going to have some great stories coming up uh, next year. Definitely have some good ones lined up. All right. Well, hope you have uh, an excellent rest of the year, Jose. Um, happy holidays to you, to everybody listening. Um, and until next time. Yeah. Happy holidays, Dixon. See you next year. <laughs>